All right, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 3 p.m. Roll call. Trustee Bartow. Here. Trustee Matoya. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Arsorlu. Here. Trustee Wygand. Here. Trustee Yelsey. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. Okay. Uh, may I request a motion to adopt the agenda? Oh. Move to adopt, adopt the agenda. Second. Then moved by Trustee Yelsey, seconded by Trustee Wygand. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoya? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Wygand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Community input on closed session items. It appears we have no cards. Okay. Then we will move to closed session. The items are A, public employee evaluation. B, conference with legal counsel. C, conference with labor negotiator. D, public employee discipline dismissal release employment. We will return to open session at 6 p.m. Move to close session at 3.01 p.m. All right, we'll call the meeting to order at 6 p.m. <clears throat> so, um, out of closed session, uh, a request was received to add consideration of ad hoc book and library committee. After review of the request, it has been determined that our administrative and board policies, board policy 1312.2 and AR 1312.2, complaints concerning instructional materials, provides for community and parent involvement at the superintendent's discretion and under his jurisdiction. Because this item is tied to a personal component of an ongoing investigation, the board discussed this item in closed session. With that, we move to opening ceremonies with the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Trustee Yelsey. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, I request an adoption of the minutes from June 14, 2022. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Wygand. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoya? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ersoilu? Yes. Trustee Wygand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Harbor Council PTA report, Lisa Buller. <laughs> And if your report is it's summer, we'll get back to you. That's fine, too. Oh, no. It was just I was expecting to be a little further down the line. So good evening. <laughs> um, I thank you for having me here. I was just um, wanting to give a quick update on the PTA. Most of our units have all their officers um, filled for next year. We have one school that's holding their election next week on the 28th. We have two of our schools will be holding their elections in August. And we have um, two schools that need presidents. <coughs> they, have their, uh, they have some of their other officers, but they don't have presidents yet. So we're um, looking good, and everybody is working hard. So um, if you talk to anybody at a couple of our, one of our high schools and one of our uh, middle schools, <coughs> they're looking for a president but they're um, in good hands. Hopefully the um, principal at the school will also help them out on that. And then the other item that I wanted to celebrate is our volunteer hours. So for the last year, we had 147,685 volunteer hours. That was reported from July 1st through April 15th. That's early because they have to get their hours to us. We then have to get it to Fourth District. Fourth District has to get it to state and on. So these should be hours through June 30th. But because of some of the lowness of their hours, I know they're not. They, I mean, it's hard to remember that you have to 
yes, on the last two months of school, which a lot of times is our busiest time for our volunteers. So anyway, when um, state and national PTA, um, they value the volunteer hours at about $25.50. So the total value of our volunteers um, money-wise is $3,771,000, no wait, $3,771,875. This is our best estimate, of course, because we don't get it all. But um, when you look at some of the hours that some of our schools put in, it is truly amazing. And even the schools that have very small PTAs did very well. So I want to just um, give a shout out to all our PTA volunteers that they did a fabulous job. And look at all that free labor we had from our wonderful PTA people. And I hope everybody has a wonderful summer. Thank you. Thank you. We have a CSEA and NMFT president's comments, although we have just a CSEA treasurer, Eleanor Rebard, tonight. <laughs> Um, good evening, uh, President Bartow, school board, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and guests. I'm Eleanor Rebard. I'm CSEA Chapter 18's treasurer, and we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Pam is at a family meeting tonight, so she could not attend. Um, classified staff are still here. We have not gone home. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Instructional assistants are in the classroom. Office assistants are at the front doors. Campus facility safety facilitators are walking the sites. Health assistants are helping the students. Transportation <coughs> is, dr is driving students to the Summer Language Academy and will be there for all summer programs starting July 6th. Nutrition Services is providing meals at summer school programs. The warehouse is delivering furniture, books, material and picking up transfers of equipment. Information technology continues to install software programs and updates and mans the ever important help desk. Budgets, accounts payable, payroll departments, move money, get vendors paid and issue our paychecks and MERs. Maintenance and operation is doing work orders, doing repairs, custodial cleaning and grounds upkeep. So. We thank every classified employee for doing their work, and thank you for this opportunity from CSCA Chapter 18. Thank you. Um, so later in the agenda, and I wanted to give a little uh, shout out and thank you. We'll be introducing our new student board members, so we're very pleased to have you here who were able to make it. Um, and we'll go on to our reports um, on the District English Language Learner Advisory Committee. Um, John uh, uh, President Bartow, uh, Dr. Smith, board members, um, it's, it's an honor to uh, ask Vanessa Gailey, uh, Carla Hernandez, and uh, School Community Facilitator Jacqueline Gatan to come to the microphone um, to share with us the events of the District English Language Advisory Committee uh, this year. I believe Ms. Hernandez um, will be uh, highlighting uh, the years and also making some recommendations as our uh, parent uh, president of the District English Language Advisory Committee. Thank you. President Bartow, Superintendent Smith, members of the board, cabinet, and guests. Um, I'm pleased to stand here um, for Laura Dale Pash. Unfortunately, she can't be here this evening, but if she would, uh, she was here, she would speak about how much she enjoys and loves working in multilingual programs and specifically with our families through the District English Learner Advisory Committee. And um, she would thank Mrs. Hernandez for her three years of service as our board president. And um, she uh, would welcome her to, to share some of the highlights from the board report. Uh, we're not gonna go through the whole report tonight, but just the highlights. Uh, Mrs. Hernandez um, is, would prefer to uh, present in Spanish, her primary language, um, and then we're going to have um, Jacqueline Gaitan Alder-Cohen, one of our school community facilitators at the district level, do the interpretation for her. So, Mrs. Hernandez. Thank you. Buenas noches, Presidente Barton, miembros de la Junta Directiva y Superintendente. Soy Carla Hernández, Presidenta de la Junta Directiva de DILAC. Los temas tratados durante las reuniones de DILAC fueron beneficiosos y revelantes para los padres. Nos encanta la colaboración entre los padres y las personas del distrito. 
Doctor Smith asistió a la junta de Dila que en enero y se, se conectó con los padres a nivel personal. Agradecemos que, que el consejo asesoral de superintendente incluya representantes de Dila. Vlad Anderson brindó una sección sobre prevención y cotización sobre el consumo de tabaco y drogas. Los padres tuvieron la oportunidad de ver y tocar muestras reales de parafernalia. La Feria de Salud Mental fue positiva y se proporcionaron diferentes recursos de Latino Health Access. Fue, un pa fue una participación destacada debido a los excelentes servicios que brindan a la comunidad. El personal del... El personal del Departamento de Programas Multilingües, incluyendo Jacqueline, Laura, Javier y Vanessa, hacen un gran esfuerzo. Sentimos que las puertas del distrito están siempre abiertas y podemos hablar con ellos incluso sobre asuntos personales. Los padres de DILAC asistieron a las conferencias de aso Asociación de Educadores Bilingües de California. Cabe por segundo año, es, un, es positivo que los niños observen a los padres tomando clases y aprendiendo. El distrito patrocinó secciones de programa de Grupo Crecer para padres de primaria y preparatoria. Los padres sintieron que Grupo Crecer fue, fue una experiencia maravillosa porque los ayudó a comprender a sus estudiantes e hizo que los padres reflexionaran sobre su propio comportamiento. Aprendieron disciplina positiva y formas de hablar con sus hijos y estrategias para escucharlos. Con respecto a la, al formato de la reunión de TILAC, a los padres les gustaría que el personal y una variación de Zoom en juntas en persona. Se recomienda que debería agregar un segundo oficial de TILAC a cada puesto de la junta directiva. Necesitamos un mejor trabajo promoviendo las juntas de ILAC en las escuelas informando a los padres sobre el comité y su propósito. Se recomienda que cada comité de ILAC tenga representantes y dos suplentes para participar en las juntas de TILAC. Sería bueno que los administradores del distrito asistieran a la ceremonia de reclasificación. Esta celebración debería ser especial y los directores deber, deben ayudar a los estudiantes a comprender la importancia de reclasificación. Los padres necesitan apoyo para comprender el significado y la importancia de la encuesta sobre el idioma del hogar durante el proceso de inscripción escolar. Muchas gracias a todos por su apoyo. Gracias. Good afternoon, President Bartel, uh, members of the board and superintendent. I am Jacqueline Gaitan Alarcón, and I am the school community facilitator, and I will translate Mrs. Hernandez's presentation. The topics covered in DLAC meetings were beneficial and relevant to parents. We love the partnership between parents and staff. Dr. Smith attended DLAC in January. He connected with parents as a human being. It is appreciated that the superintendent's advisory council includes a DLAC parent. Vlad Anderson provided a session on tobacco and drug awareness. Parents had the chance to view and touch actual samples of paraphernalia. The mental health fair was positive and many resources were provided. Latino health access was a highlight because of the excellent services they provide to the community. The staff for the multilingual programs include Jacqueline, Laura, Javier, and Vanessa go the extra mile. We feel like the district doors are always open for us. We can even talk with the staff about personal issues. DILAC parents attended CABE, California Association for Bilingual Educators, for second year. It is positive that children see their parents learning and taking classes during the afternoon. That's amazing. The district sponsored Grupo Crecer sessions for elementary and secondary parents. Parents <coughs> felt Grupo Crecer was a wonderful opportunity because not only help parents, 
and also help parents to understand and reflect on their behavior. Parents learn positive discipline, ways to talk with their children, and listening strategies. Regarding the DLAC meeting format, parents would like a staff to explore a variation of Zoom and in person. We need to do a better job promoting ELAC at the school sites and letting, letting parents know about the committee and its purpose. Each ELAC should have two DLAC reps and two alternates. It would be nice for administrators from the district to attend reclassification ceremonies. These celebrations should be special and principals need to help students understand the importance of reclassification. Parents need support understanding the meaning and importance of the home language survey during enrollment. Thank you for all your support. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to work with such a wonderful group of parents. Thank you. All right, next we have B, report on LCFF local performance indicators for California State Dashboard. Dr. Torres? Yes, at this time, I'd like to welcome Vanessa Gailey back to the microphone. She's going to be presenting tonight. Good evening. I'm going to put up the presentation. Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, again, uh, President Bartow, Dr. Smith, uh, members of the board, cabinet, and guests. Uh, tonight we are presenting the required local performance indicators report. It's uh, required to be presented alongside the LCAP for approval. So last week we presented the LCAP and had the public hearing. And tonight, I'm oh, sorry, the local control and accountability plan. And so these are the local performance indicators that are required by the state. The local indicators are some of the areas that are not publicly available data, and so they are a self-reporting process <laughs> on five of the eight required state priorities. And they will be presented on the California School Dashboard, which has undergone a few changes since the pandemic has hit us. Um, so right now, if the public was to go to the dashboard, they would see the 2020 21 report, and when they reopen the dashboard with the new data, they will see the contents of this report from this evening. Um, they don't usually open it until the summertime, so if someone was to go tomorrow, they wouldn't find this report. But we're going to be posting uh, this slide deck as the report on our website, on our local control and accountability <coughs> section of district plans on our webpage. So the requirement is that the district measure its progress that it report results to the local governing board and to members of the public, and then we determine whether we have met, not met, or not met for two years each of the local <laughs> performance indicators. So essentially, the requirement is measure and report, and we have met. Okay, so in area one, basic conditions of learning, the uh, elements here are the elements that are required in the school accountability report cards, and they're required under the Williams legislation. So um, we report on the number of misassignments of teachers of English learners in our district, as well as total teacher misassignments and vacant teacher positions. And you can see it's extremely low, two out of our entire teaching workforce. And uh, zero is the number of students without access to their own copies of standards aligned instructional materials. We have materials available for every student for all of the content areas. And also we have zero, the number of identified instances where our facilities do not meet the good repair standard. 100% of our Newport Mesa sites meet the overall standard of good or exempl <coughs> exemplary. And there's a tool called the facilities inspection tool that is used to um, identify those ratings. All right, so we've met priority one. In terms of the implementation of state standards, the state has provided a self-reflection tool uh, using a scale of 1 to 10, starting with an exploration and research phase and um, going all the way to a full implementation and sustainability level. 
So just a reminder that one isn't necessarily bad, it just means that it's a starting point um, or, and a place to grow from. Um, and we do a, a self-ranking process. So um, we've worked with uh, department chairs, we've worked with uh, site administrators, district leadership. So take a look at the, uh, the ratings in our, um, our self-reflection tool. The first is in um, professional learning for teaching. Bless you. <laughs> and um, according to the, the adopted standards. And so uh, we're looking in the areas of English language arts, English language development, math, next gen science, and um, history social science. And so what the, uh, the gray box represents is the current year results, and then the X's are last year. So oftentimes we get asked, well, how do we compare to last year? So this time we wanted to make sure we took the guesswork out of it. Um, one of the things that we want to point out is that we're doing really incredible work in, um, in science and in history social science. It's been a really long time since we've adopted materials in science. And next-gen science standards have been around for quite a while. But the pandemic didn't help. We've had a flow and a process to rolling out our adoptions. Um, and so, so that really is reflecting. And again, the, the numbers here reflect a combination of elementary and secondary. And sometimes we have places that are different. Secondary has recently had a history adoption, while elementary has not. So we have to kind of find the happy medium. But in response, we want to make sure that people understand we are ready to support professional learning and next year with a, hopefully a more normal year and we're able to really count on our calendar. Um, we know that our comprehensive professional development plan um, will, will be robust. Um, we've done a needs assessment. We went way back in November um, to support the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant. We will annually be doing the survey uh, on November 1st, the PD day, so that everyone has a, a real opportunity to respond. And of course, we're coordinating calendars, our online resources, and our systems to make sure that people understand what professional learning is available to them, whether it is in person or whether it is asynchronous. <laughs> In terms of instructional materials, again, we're looking at um, when was the last adoption, um, how recent are the standards, and so we think that this reflects um, what is in front of folks and um, also um, recognizing, again, um, when things have been adopted and when they haven't. We have updated our multi-year instructional materials adoption schedule to really look at the multi-year impact um, so that we're not adopting everything all at once. Um, we also do an annual report in October on Williams sufficiency. We attest to the fact that we do have enough materials for our students. We are planning a history, social studies, and science pilot in um, elementary for next year. And then we have elementary and secondary science pilots planned for next year as well. In terms of supporting staff, staff with instruction, our policies or programs to help really identify areas that we can um, improve and align our curriculum and instruction, um, we also really think about what supports we provide to, to folks to elevate um, their practice. So again, we rely on the professional development survey, the um, principal classroom walkthroughs, um, really having, having them get some good dialogue about uh, the instruction. Uh, we also have instructional coaches at the secondary level, and we have the digital fellows at elementary and second. And then we have push-in and co-teaching models that we think are going to be really helpful in the next year, knowing again that substitutes are limited. And so we really have to be very thoughtful about how we're providing support um, for our instructional improvement. Um, math, English, history, and science are not the only game in town, so we also look at career tech ed, health, PE, VAPA, and world language. And again, thinking about how we're looking at really implementing our state standards. Um, our, we're very proud of our uh, career technical education program and the alignment to the model um, curriculum and state standards. Of course, we're so proud of the elementary and secondary PE, the instruction offered by both our classroom instructors as well as our specialists. And then we have such wonderful VAPA support, visual and performing arts, um, with a collaboration district-wide as well as a, a dedicated TOSA to support that work. And then support for teachers and administrators, really kind of, again, thinking about professional development and identifying how we can support individuals as well as groups. Um, we know that uh, the pandemic really was challenging in trying to come back, and we've really been focusing on keeping the doors open and keeping everyone in classrooms. Um, so we know we have some work to do, um, but we're very pleased to have formed the P3 literacy team as one example of a cross-divisional group, really working and focusing on the board priority of early literacy, and also really thinking about um, the needs of our teachers. We've done focus groups and in-depth interviews with um, groups of teachers um, throughout uh, the, the spring and fall, uh, particularly at our title schools. And then again, we have our teachers on special assignment and instructional coaches. We're pleased that we're adding two teachers on assignment at the secondary level for next year. So we really are, are again, building the capacity of the team uh, to support professional development. 
So we have met priority two, implementation of state academic standards. And moving on to parent and family engagement. The three areas that we look at in parent and family engagement are seeking input, building relationships, and building partnerships. And again, this is a tool that the state has provided. And so we have some structures in place to um, have uh, parent and family involvement and advisement. In terms of decision making, we have our site level advisory groups, school site council, and English learner advisory committee for those schools with um, enough students, 21 or more at the schools. We also have robust participation in our parent teacher association and PTO. In terms of access, we provide translation and interpretation to all sites that need it, whether it is in Spanish or we also have um, contracts with the language network if we have hard to fill languages like Mandarin or uh, other languages. And then in terms of uh, parent education, we have workshops that are linked to learning and social emotional growth. We provide them at the district level. We provide Grupo Crisair, as uh, was mentioned earlier. And then at the school sites, there are also workshops. Now granted, our schools uh, were not open to all of our families until mid-year, so we did not have as many as usual, um, but we're really looking forward to next year and I'm bringing back some of the parent education, some specific literacy nights and focus on what are the families needing to learn about academics and social emotional and behavior now. In our um, LCAP survey, we have our survey results. You can see a high number of participants felt that they were encouraged to participate, whether it was in PTA or to come to the school events, um, to be part of the parent education series, to be part of our DLAC and our ELAC. Um, so we're, we're pleased with that. Um, we know that we still, um, school site council isn't always the most fun thing to go to, so we're always very appreciative of our parents who are willing to come and participate in that. Um, it, it was a real challenge in the pandemic to get um, full participation, so we are hoping that now that we're in person, we can link more to activities on campuses and people will be able to participate uh, in that. So we really feel like we're kind of in the middle, uh, looking at initial implementation on a couple of things, really building some of the capacity around making sure that it's two-way and people understand what's decision-making and what's um, more input, and really thinking about how we are um, making sure that we're seeking input from all of our underrepresented groups. Of course, we have our English Learner Advisory Committee, but again, we want to make sure our families understand what happens at those meetings and what kind of input they're able to share. And then also, uh, an area of focus that we want to look, look at is a number Number four, really working together to co-create and co-construct and, of course, evaluate our family engagement. And so uh, we're putting into place processes for the next year where after our parent and family advisories and events, we're gathering their input, um, hopefully in a more meaningful way. Um, we've I've had some recent input about trying to make sure it's meaningful engagement and collecting some of that qualitative data. So that will be an area of focus for us for next year. And in terms of building relationships, again, we feel like we're in a good place that we, of course, have respectful and trusting places and they're welcoming. We want to continue to make sure all families know that they are welcome. Um, and we really want to continue to work on um, looking at all of the assets that our families are bringing to the table, especially multilingual, multicultural, and thinking about ways that we can cultivate and support that. Um, and then also thinking about, again, just that two-way communication. Um, we have to make sure it's in that accessible format and um, we're working on our visuals, we're working on our platforms forms, really trying to make sure that um, everybody's getting the message in numerous ways. And then uh, we also focused on some of the additional programs that we provided. Um, we do have the parent education series. It was virtual this year. Uh, in some years it has been face-to-face. Uh, -face. And um, Grupo Crisair also very well received and it was uh, one of those um, things that kind of grew from the ground. Uh, Ray Elementary in Victoria um, had been using them and so the, the word spread. So we were really pleased to, to support that work. And then also we do have funding for elementary in particular for site-based work because we have received so much feedback over the years about knowing that families want to go to their home school and hear from their children's teachers and their administrators about what they can do to support their children. So we try and make sure that we're really supporting that both with content and with funding. So uh, we, we always know that we want to build our capacity for our families and provide professional learning, and we really haven't done that. So we want to um, continue to think about what would be meaningful professional development for our staffs, um, and thinking, too, about just the policies and programs to help support teachers to communicate with their kiddos or with their uh, families to understand um, how students are doing. So um, you saw all of the levels of implementation. That will be what, what's reported out on the, uh, the, the website on the dashboard. And then you'll see an area of strength and focus as I've gone through um, this evening. So we've met priority three.
Okay, school climate. Okay, I'm gonna have my partner Sarah Coley come up here and talk to you about the uh, Priority 6 school climate. Thank you so much and good evening. Um, so as you know, we administered the California Healthy Kids Survey both last year as well as this year. Um, we are still currently waiting for our district and site level reports for this year. So you'll notice that the indicators are the same data that we shared with you last year. So California Healthy Kids is administered to students in grades um, five, five, seven, nine, and 11. Um, so we work collaboratively with our sites to make sure that it's administered within the window. So our priority for school climate um, we currently have been administering the chicks every two years. We did decide this year to administer it in an off year just because one, we wanted to have some comparative data from last year to this year, but then also it is best practice. And so um, we are looking ahead to see what we'll be doing in subsequent years, um, but we feel that it'll show some really valuable data um, and really help us to identify the areas where we can continue to support our students. Um, so the areas that we looked at here were school connectedness, high expectations, and caring adults. So um, you'll notice that our fifth grade questions are a little bit, they're phrased a little bit different than our seventh, ninth, and 11th grade questions, obviously making sure that they're age appropriate. So looking at school connectedness, um, you can notice in the table um, there to the right that students that are in fifth grade, 77%, um, average reporting yes most of the time or yes all of the time. For questions such as, do you feel close to people at school? Are you happy to be at this school? Do you feel like you're a part of this school? Do teachers treat students fairly at this school and do you feel safe? And so it's not to say that more students don't maybe feel neutral about this or agree at some level, but this is really just showing us that it's most of the time or all of the time. And then for our seventh, ninth, and 11th grade students, so questions are, I feel close to people at this school, I'm happy to be at this school, and I feel like I'm a part of this school. And we do recognize that as students are getting older, that we are seeing a slight decrease in students feeling connected to their campuses. And so um, we are looking for opportunities to continue to work with all of our staff to provide those opportunities to build relationships and connections at school. So it's not a huge decrease, but it's noted. And so we definitely want to make sure that we're addressing that as we're moving forward. And then as far as caring adults, so questions such as do our teachers and grown-ups, um, other grown-ups care about you? You know, again, asking our fifth graders questions that are appropriate to them age level wise. Um, do they listen when they have something to say? Do they make an effort to get to know you? And then for our seventh, ninth, and 11th graders, um, that there's a teacher or someone from my school who really cares about me or notices when I'm, when I'm not there um, and who listens to me when I have something to say. And again, we do notice a difference. Um, we thought it was interesting to see the kind of the biggest difference between seventh and ninth grade. So when students are going from middle school to the high school level, um, and so again, it's been noted and really helps us to focus in on where we can help as students are transitioning to help them find adults and build those connections and those relationships at their school sites. And then last is high expectations, which of course we feel is, is especially important. So how are our students feeling as far as people telling them that they're doing a good job at school? Do teachers and other grownups believe that they can do a good job? Um, do they feel like someone's telling them that they should do their best? Um, and so looking for, um, or at our fifth graders, so 89%, which is relatively high for students to say that it's yes all of the time or that they strongly agree. Um, and then again, we notice that there's a slight decline as students are getting older. So again, an area of focus for us to be able to work with our staff and how are we setting expectations for students but then communicating that to them and telling them that we believe in them. Um, and that really does um, align with the work that we're, we're doing moving forward. So we look forward to seeing the data from this year to really have that comparative analysis for where students were feeling last year to this year as well as moving forward. Um, so with this, we did meet the priority, um, which, is, which is exciting for us. And so again, we're, we're looking forward to the work that we have um, going forward. We know there's, there's more to do, but it, it's good news so far. Thank you. Yeah. And then rounding out the priorities, uh, course access. And so we are uh, measuring the, ex looking at the extent to which um, students have access to a broad course of study. And then also the supports that are provided um, for students who are unduplicated as well as students with exceptional needs. How the district will measure itself, we continue to look at our graduation rates, our cohort outcomes, that group of students who's gone all the way through from freshman to senior year. We also look at the students meeting the um, Cal State requirements, also known as the A to G requirements, uh, UC as well. Um, career technical, technical education pathways and completion. And then lastly, our visual and performing arts. <laughs> 
So our broad course of study, which is outlined in EdCode, um, is the, what you typically think of as the core English history, math, science, as well as health, PE, and VAPA um, in both grade levels. And at the grades 7 through 12, we also add applied arts, foreign language, and career technical education. So our, our um, default program for elementary is a broad course of study as well as our secondary. Um, our outcomes, we, we use a five-year outcome in our local control and accountability plan. So you can see uh, quite high on our all for graduation rate, especially as compared to the rest of the county and the state. For our English learners, 84.1%. Uh, uh, we have our low-income and student with disabilities also very, very high graduation rates comparatively. And of course, um, when you go to the more rigorous level of requirements for Cal State and UC um, uh, acceptance, you do notice that the graduation rate goes down. That doesn't mean students didn't graduate. It just means this is the percentage of students who graduated meeting those higher requirements. I also want to point out English learners. When an English learner is still an English learner in 12th grade, that means that that student does not have the, the skills commensurate to their English speaking peers, right? Because they were not reclassified. So the number that you don't see is our reclassified student rate, the students who used to be English learners and then became uh, reclassified. And those numbers are typically extremely high. So I just want to point out, it's kind of, uh, it's a, a little bit difficult when you think and you look, oh gosh, English learners, only 13.9%. But if you're a student that um, is an English learner as a 12th grader, that typically means it's a real challenge for you to pass college level courses. Okay. So career technical education in VAPA, we have um, 186 completers last year. Um, so it was a 10.6 uh, CTE completion rate um, of the overall um, uh, group of graduates. And our secondary VAPA classes, we had 225. So we've maintained our VAPA offerings over the course of the last three years. These are some of the pathways that we offer. Again, everybody should check out our website and look at our career technical education pathways. They are stellar. They are um, exquisitely uh, displayed on the, the website. And our California Department of Education holds our program up as a district that's a model for federal program monitoring, something that's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> So for elementary, as I said, it's a broad course of study that's the default instructional program. Our students all have access to music, PE, and science, both through their teachers of record, as well as additional from uh, the specialists. So we're very proud of that additional support. We also know for our English learner students that they get 30 minutes or more of the required designated English language development alongside the integrated, integrated language development that occurs in all of their content areas. And then uh, the remainder of instruction is with their English only peers. So they're only grouped according to proficiency level for a short amount of time, but for targeted instructional support. And for our students with an IEP, to the extent possible, um, many of our students are included. So we have our mild, moderate um, disabilities uh, included in our classrooms along with their age level peers. And then of course our students with the mod severe disabilities are provided their broad course of study through unique learning systems and through um, appropriate settings uh, designated by their IEP. So to the extent possible, we try and have inclusion and when not possible, we still provide that broad course of study. So for some of our barriers, um, we know that when students get Fs, and they get multiple Fs, it's usually not one or two, it's five or six. So it really is a challenge for kids to try and dig out of that hole. And we've really noticed that in the pandemic. And so it just makes it harder both to continue to learn and then to earn the credits that were missed. Um, we also still know that we need to provide more consistent during the day reading and math instruction and intervention and really continue to work on refining that. Um, and then uh, we also know that we have very grading and homework practices throughout the district. So really continuing to look at um, when we are eliciting and responding to student thinking, how are they getting that feedback? And then how much and how, what's the different type uh, types of homework that they're getting? And then we also do know that there are challenges for recently arrived students, right? Not just academic, but in terms of their experience as a child, um, some trauma uh, sometimes. And we know that um, wherever they are academically then uh, sets them on a path. So the older they are when they come and the less schooling they've had, it is more of a challenge to be able to graduate them on time. So in terms of informing the LCAP, um, we continue to provide that broad course of study as the default, and we continue to provide A, a to G aligned courses um, to the students as their first option, and we continue to provide many CTE pathways that can lead to certificate or to um, subsequent college and career readiness. And then lastly, we continue to provide uh, a robust tutorial supports, whether it is through an online platform or at the school site. 
um, and in a variety of um, in-class supports. Um, we've offered quite a bit of credit recovery and intervention post-pandemic. And of course, we have offered increased summer enrichment and remediation. And then in terms of informing the LCAP and our English learners, again, we provide multiple intensive classes of designated ELD, um, especially for our students new to the country. We also continue to provide scaffolds and supports in other areas um, and to really think about that as integrated language development. And I want to say again, it's not just English language arts. Language development occurs in every content areas that's integrated English language development. And then, of course, we're always really looking at ways to support um, scheduling for students who are at EL levels two and three because we want to find the balance of getting them that academic support while also giving them access to electives. And then lastly, thinking through um, students with an IEP, um, we continue to refine our instructional practices through inclusive practices, really where those mild to moderate students with disability are included with their age level peers, and really thinking about that support from the special ed staff, pushing into, and then also thinking about the pulling out. Um, we have that consistent collaboration that we're continuing to cultivate between general education and special education, um, and uh, we want to make sure that the students are getting that access to broad courses of study. So we have met the priority for course access, measured and reported. Reminder on our local indicators, um, they were the basic conditions of learning, the implementation of state standards, parent and family engagement, school climate, and access to a broad course of study. That concludes the report of the local indicators. Well done. Does anyone have any comments? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Oh, I apologize. Oh, I just, Trustee Anderson. Sorry, I just had one question about um, the 2021-22 survey results for family and community engagement. Yes. It would be interesting to see what those were compared to 2019 or 2018. Would you be able to send that to us, please? Yes, absolutely. And for anyone interested in our um, survey report, we have the historical reports, the full report, and English and Spanish. So um, you can dig deeper into that. But we'll get you the comparisons. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, report on universal pre-kindergarten plan, Mr. Drake. Yes, I'd like to call Kathleen Leary, our Director of Early Childhood Education up. Uh, President Barto, Dr. Smith, board members, executive cabinet, and guests. Um, I'm here today to give you an update on our universal pre-kindergarten plan. As you remember, I was in front of you, well, we were in front of you both in, in the fall and in the winter just to give you updates, and this should be our final um, update. Um, what is, just a reminder what universal pre-kindergarten is, it is, um, gives the opportunity of all four-year-olds, um, regardless of where they live, what language they speak, or their income level for a high quality uh, learning experience the year before they enter kindergarten. And for Newport Mesa, we will be using a mixed delivery model to ensure that students and or actually families have the choice. So based on what the needs of the child and the family, they may enter in a TK classroom, they may attend a state preschool program if they are eligible, or they may attend a preschool, a tuition preschool program. So all of those together encompass what universal pre-K is. And the why behind um, universal pre-K um, is that research demonstrates um, that children who attend a high quality pre-kindergarten program really come into school prepared for school. They have the early literacy school skills, early math skills, and all those, most importantly, those social emotional learning skills. Kids can self-regulate, they are able to follow directions, you know, they're able to make friends. Those are all really important skills that they learn in um, pre-kindergarten. So for next year, for 22-23, if a child is born between September 2nd 
2016 and September 1st, 2017, then they would be eligible for kindergarten. Um, if they are born between September 2nd, 2017 and February 2nd, 2018, parents may choose. They may choose to send them to the elementary school to the transitional kindergarten, or they may send them um, to one of the preschool programs. So we have two different types of uh, state preschool. One is a park day, which is three hours, and the other, as you recall, is a full day, full year. So not only do the parents need to have income and eligibility, but there needs to be a need, and that goes all day, and it goes 246 days. So we're still in session right now. We go all summer, um, and then if they are a three-year-old or born between September, September, February 3rd, 2018, and December 1st, 2019, they can attend one of our preschool programs. Now, just a little refresher of what the rollout looks like. We started this year as our planning year, and um, I'm gonna show all of the people that have been involved in our planning. But starting next year, like I mentioned, um, students need to have their fifth birthday between September 2nd and February 2nd. By 23, 24, they have to have their fifth birthday between September 2nd and April 2nd. By 24, 25, their fifth birthday is between September 2nd and June 2nd. And last but not least, the full rollout will be in 2025, 2026, where their fourth birthday is before September, or is by September 1st. And when I met with the TK teachers the other day and I've met with principals, I try to put it in this light a little bit. So we start in August. So when our children are starting, they may, if they have a birthday of September 1st, they may be coming to our, through our doors as three-year-olds. Oh, so wow. when we're talking about environment and when we're talking about assessment and curriculum, that is really Im important that we keep that in mind when we're developing all of those things. So the UPK plan, which was uh, the template was given to us by the state, has these areas, the vision and coherence, community engagement and partnership, workforce recruitment and professional learning, curriculum instruction and assessment, um, LEA facilities, services, and operations. So I'm just going to go briefly over a few of them. They're all in the plan. But first of all, I need to uh, give a big shout out to everyone who really um, has met with me many, many times um, to talk about what the plan and what we need to do in order to roll out a brand new grade level, which we have not rolled out in over 100 years. So <laughs> this was, you know, really needed a concerted effort to make sure that we can do this correctly. So first of all, our vision um, for early learning and it aligns beautifully with the goals of the board that we are focusing on the whole child, that we have a high quality education for the whole child, that our environment is safe and nurturing and engaging, and that we're really focusing on those early literacy and math skills. The other piece about the plan that really excited me, I'm just going to tell you really, <laughs> to be quite honest, is that we're really looking at the P3 alignment. I have been, you know, talking because I've had the experience of being at the elementary school, both as a teacher and a principal, and now with the experience of being a pre, you know, being in the preschool set world, how important it is that we connect preschool with what's going on in the early grades. And so we are working together to make that, um, coherence happen. And we've started with a P3 literacy team. We started that back in December 2021. We have teachers, TOSAs, preschool teachers. We have our um, administrator, site administrator, and district administrator, including special ed. We want to all be in the same room when we're talking about what the expectations from preschool through third grade, that we can then outline what um, the professional development will be, what our student assessments and instructional practices. So working co collaborative with teachers and administrators alike to um, build our coherence. So I've been throwing out a lot of terms. First of all, the universal TK, which is a very important part of the UPK system or the universal pre-K. 
because un universal preschool, as I mentioned, is that mixed del delivery. It includes the state preschool um, and our tuition preschool. And then last but not least, all, both of those fit in the P3 system. And this was kind of a, a model that the state had rolled out, and I added that we it really have to see it in terms of a P12, because I firmly believe that if we have a strong P3, it would lead to a much stronger um, P12. So community engagement, we did receive lots of input from um, the district staff. We met with both NMFT and CSCA in November. We've met with preschool teachers and TK teachers. We had a uh, principals committee that uh, had some of the site administrators to talk about some of the plans and how we're going to roll this out. We also included Project Kids Connect, which is also under my umbrella. Um, as you remember from last week when I um, mentioned the ELOP plan, that we are going to be adding TK to our after school program. So it's really important that we have that connection between after school. Uh, we also added questions in the LCAP staff forum. Um, and then the community input, preschool parent advisory. We meet monthly or every other month with our preschool parents. So we received input from them. We presented at the DLAC. Um, Harbor, P uh, Harbor Council PTA. We also had an LCAP survey question in, in the LCAP survey, as well as the public forums. And we've met with some local preschools to kind of talk to them and, and, and to, we've always tried to partner with them, but especially with this rollout, we wanted to make sure we strengthen those partnerships. And so I added also to our little, um, UPK Funnel is the community-based organiza um, organizations for expanded learning because we will be relying on organizations like the YMCA and Boys and Girls Club as we're providing wraparound services for our, our children. Professional learning. Um, the other thing, again, going back to the P3, I'm very excited about the fact that we have 16 principals and district administrators that are involved in the P3 Leadership Certificate Program through the University of um, Colorado at Denver. And they're giving up their Saturday mornings um, once a month as well as some afternoons to um, do some of the reading and the research, to listen to webinars, as well as really getting a basis so that we can create um, that P3 continuum um, together. They're gonna, we're gonna learn about best practices and then we're gonna create the system. And then, of course, we need to do lots of professional development for teachers. Um, there are some things that will be available during the summer on their own time, but also there will be some professional learning opportunities that are going to be set up during their PD days when right before school starts. Um, in addition, they will be able to do some of the other things like the thinking maps training that um, Lori Hernandez had outlined um, weeks ago, I can't remember exactly, that that will be happening, um, as well as curriculum training for all of the curriculum, as well as really a focus on early literacy. Um, I put this here first because we're talking about curriculum instruction, and for me, this is critical piece is the learning environment, that when we are talking a TK classroom, we're talking you know, by the time it's 25, 26, as I mentioned, they're going to be really young four-year-olds. And so we have to have an environment that is developmentally appropriate. And so really working with staff on what that looks like and creating that high-quality learning environment that is intentional because someone might walk into a room and see kids playing, but then they might just think it's play. But if you really talk to the kids or you talk to the teachers about the intention of what's going on, you'll see that it's developmentally appropriate. So we are going to be spending some time in the um, summer and right before school starts to give some PD on what it looks like for the TK classroom environment. Their curriculum, um, most of this, or all of it, I should say, is one, ones that we do use in preschool, and it also bridges into the elementary, especially the world of wonders and the bridges in math. We also incorporate the second step, um, very, uh, you know, the puppets, and they really get into learning about how to be friends and how to um, pay attention and um, 
and to self-regulation, all of those things, as well as the fine motor. We're finding, especially since the pandemic, we're finding that even in preschool, our children aren't coming in with the necessary finger strength to be able to hold a pencil. So really working on the fine motor skills is another goal. Um, TK assessments. So it's going to be two parts. We are using the building blocks of learning for both pre-K and TK. And this is a district made assessment and really looking at some of those school readiness skills. A lot of the early literacy and early math as well as fine motor. And next year we are going to have a TK assessment committee to really look at some of those assessments that are in the state that are developmentally appropriate so that they have the input because the state guidelines really require us to monitor uh, progress based on what is developmentally appropriate and they're observ observational. So we, one example that we might use is it's called the DRDP developmentally um, Oh my gosh, I'm stuck up here. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But we use that in preschool, so we will look to see if that is one option that we would use. And facilities. Um, working closely with Ara and her team, we did a careful analysis of the projected enrollment, and for next year, we, um, there is adequate space not only for our transitional kindergarten, uh, children but for our current preschool classrooms and that's really important that because we said that we're going to be providing choice that we have enough room for both and um, start, just a reminder starting next year we're looking um, to offer a transitional kindergarten at school sites in which they have a um, enrollment of at least 10 children um, and so we are looking at enrollment very carefully every week Dr. Sir and myself have been analyzing that and this is what we uh, kind of a projected enrollment our, our after looking at the trends we've been looking at the trends since basically 2013 all the way to the current really looking and analyzing it plus adding a couple months we see that the possibly next year we'll have as many as 312 uh, TK children and you'll notice that I do anticipate that our, our state preschool as well as our tuition preschool numbers will probably decrease. Um, however, that 108 um, tu tuition preschool number is current. We are almost fully enrolled there. So that is, that is good news. And now I'm any questions? Trustee Wigan and Trustee Crane. Can you tell me a little bit about what uh, in the facilities we have to do or what what constitutes a TK classroom for uh, for um, in the facilities types of format? What do we need to add? What does it need to have? What do we have currently? So um, current standards with Title V, um, the, uh, and maybe Jeff, can answer this a little bit better than I can, but um, really looking at the square footage, um, about 1,300 square foot feet, um, with a bathroom that is in the complex of the of the kindergarten or TK um, classrooms. Um, also, that outside that we have appropriate tables that are you know child at the, this appropriate height, as well as the um, playground equipment is at the appropriate height. So a lot of the things that we do at preschool would be adequate for what we're doing in TK. And we don't have bathrooms in all of our preschool classrooms, right? So it's not something that is um, required unless, and I don't know, Jeff, if you want to speak a little bit more to that. Once we make a change, we have to make a change to the whole thing. So if we turn to something, then then we got to make that change. That makes sense. That, um, and, and we will do that where appropriate. So we don't have, we might not have enough classrooms right now, but if we have to do any type of construction, then we would have to um, make the TK classroom those by those dimensions and all the things that I spoke about. As our enrollment inc increases, do you think in those later years, by 2025, we'll have to build out more classrooms with bathrooms and all those qualifications? I think we're looking at that through the facility study. Yeah, you see that in the master plan. Yeah. Okay. Trustee Crane and then Trustee Anderson. 
Yeah, this is very exciting. And I've spoken to a lot of parents who are excited that the possibility of being able to send their children um, to uh, TK. Um, there is a, a little bit of an anxiety, though, ar around that, because um, when you mentioned the classroom environment, I think that kind of uh, alleviates some of the questions I was going to have, because you're making sure that it is age appropriate, developmentally appropriate. And so you're not going to be teaching reading because they're not quite ready. You're, you're basically focusing on what they are ready at that age, at that moment. And I think that's what a lot of parents are kind of worried. Oh, no, you know, we don't want to put the academics in there. Well, it's not really. It's age appropriate. And so and I'm, I love the fact that you're, you know, the staff has got professional development and training and all that to do that. And um, the academics are all done in a very play-based way. Right, play-based, because that's what they should be playing, doing at age three. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, the other thing is that some parents were, were thinking that we would be combining kindergarten with TK. That is not the case, no, right? Not, yeah. Okay, good. All right. And um, the fact that we, this, this, in regards to the facilities question that Trustee Weigand brought up, um, I know that because of the way we're funded, this is an unfunded liability. And so anyone out there, write to your legislators, <laughs> encourage them to be able to um, help the basic eight districts in funding those liabilities because from what I heard from the last last week, it was about a 12 million expenditure for one and the other, and then there's also facilities, which is 13 million. So 15 for the facilities and 10 for the program. So $25 million unfunded liability. So write your legislators. Fun TK, no matter where you live. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Anderson. Um, thank you. I'm glad to see that you are using um, the University of Colorado's program. Um, I love that they do a two-generational model, so mm -hmm. they focus on not just the children, but yes. also their parents and the family and building a great community environment. Um, I was wondering around the um, assessment, I know we have typically done the EDI, the Early Developmental Index um, study, um, and I was just wondering if there's a way for us to maybe send information about that home, maybe when families enroll mm -hmm. or you know the first couple of weeks of school, and just talking about the five domains are physical health, social competency, mm -hmm. emotional maturity, language and cognitive skills, and communication skills. Um, because I know that we've looked at it in the past and people think, oh, well, school might be really high academically, but it might have much lower numbers with the social um, engagement piece and just sharing well. So I was just thinking it could be a great opportunity as people re-enroll for the fall or if there are new families to our district that are doing TK to give them that information and let them know here's something that we're looking for. This is something to strive for and work with your child because um, people may not know. Right. No, thank you for that. And I appreciate that you brought up the EDI because we did have the EDI for all kindergarten children this year. So it'll be interesting when we get the results to see how the pandemic affected kindergarten readiness. So I should have that information to you um, late August, beginning of September. The other thing, just to let you know, we also created, and we did this last year, but kindergarten readiness backpacks for all children enrolling in TK and kindergarten. So not only do they receive supplies, but there are online resources through our Kindergarten Readiness website that parents can access. So yes, and That's if there wonderful. is some information about the EDI on that website. Great, thank you. Right. Right. Thank you so much, that was very comprehensive and I love to see all the ways in which you answered all my questions. Okay. I, had <laughs> Good. I had lots of developmental questions and things like that. So. Um, uh, thank you very much for okay. handling. Thank you. All right, and with that, we move to community input on non-agendized items. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items not on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on non-agenda topics are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. By order of the Brown Act, Section 54954.2, the board will take no action nor have any discussion on non-agendized items. The superintendent may provide clarification during superintendent's comments. 
Thank you. We'll begin with April Murray and then Wendy Lease. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Barto, and members of the board. Uh, my name is April. I'm a mother of four, and I have one that went through the Newport Mesa School District, and I have one that remains in high school. But I don't come to you tonight as a concerned parent, but as a Costa Mesa resident and taxpayer for the last decade. Last summer, I spoke to this board on three separate occasions about the ADL <clears throat> and their lack of transparency with their training materials. And after many months of bringing this to your attention, Superintendent Smith, both verbally and via email, assured the community that he serves that this district would not move forward with the ADL for any future trainings or projects. This decision was because their materials were proprietary and the district did not feel comfortable using them. So what happened between now and then? What changed? How many other organizations were considered for this anti-bias training, if any? What we do know is that a needs assessment was never done for the district to justify this new two-year contract with the ADL. Why not? If we're paying for the ADL's resources, we want to know exactly what we're paying for and why, especially given their controversial breaking down bias trainings as listed on their websites. In regards to the needs assessment that was never done, I believe that it's your job to ensure that the money we spend on our children's education is spent wisely and for good cause. That means doing your due diligence and vetting every company or organization that this district entrusts our children with and, and justifying it to us, your community. Those are the duties that you campaigned for and got elected to do. So on behalf of the many concerned parents, I don't speak just for myself this evening, um, we're asking that you just cancel this contract with the ADL immediately. It just doesn't make sense. We did a lot of work last summer and we all sat up here and we gave you our evidence-based uh, you know, opinions on why it wasn't something we wanted you to move forward with. I wasn't here last week for the meeting, but I did watch you all on YouTube, and I was happy to see that you took the item off of the agenda because there was questions that many of you had. Five of you decided that we shouldn't move forward with this until we know more. I know that the training starts on July 26th, and I know that you have 30 days prior to that date to cancel the contract and not receive any fines or, or penalties for that. So we have until the June 26th for you to make a decision. So it's, I'm hopeful that you all will have clarity and that you will decide to not move forward with any sort of trainings with the ADL. Um, and we'll just continue to pray that you guys find that in your hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Wendy Lease and then Dorothy Caruso. Good evening, uh, Board President Bartow and Mr. Dr. Smith and members of the board. My name is Wendy Lease, and I've added up the years that I've been an educator. It's been 54. So um, college, and I've seen a lot of trends come and go in college, and then teaching. Actually, I was a substitute at Ensign in the early 70s. Wasn't really fun with the, <laughs> that group. But you know, we had the whole language, the new, new math, goals 2000, um, you know, a lot of things. And now we've got critical race theory and, and uh, ADL. But I want to remind you of the professional governance standards from the California School Board Association to be an effective and individual trustee. Recognizes and respects differences of perspective and style on the board and among staff, students, parents, and the community. And we were here last summer talking about this contract that would not allow us to see the materials that we pay for. And I've done several public records requests. There's no needs assessment. And I did one this week asking for the materials described in the contract, the exhibit A that was not attached to the contract a copy of the six to 12 hour ADL training and uh, for the site-based coordinator that mentioned and the site-based leader stipend um, and a copy of the site-based leader schedule. That was all mentioned in the contract, but I can't get a copy of it. Now, if you've done this before, then 
there should be some place on some shelf a notebook from the previous ADL trainings that the public should be allowed to see. And, uh, but this is the policy that you follow. And then there's another one, to operate effectively, the board must have a unity of purpose. And this one is, govern with board adopted policies and procedures. So last week we pre presented a request for an item to be on the agenda regarding a parent or a, a, a community-based overview of the library books so that we follow the policies. So right here it says that ensure opportunities for the diverse range of views in the community to inform board deliberations. That's what we're doing when we take time and come up here and talk to you, that we are the community and we represent a lot of other people. I hope in the superintendent's comments that you'll respond to the request for the agenda item and that you won't put the, this on the, about ADL at the next board meeting in the summer. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Dorothy Caruso. Oh boy, I get to see the board again. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Superintendent Smith, Michelle, President, everybody. I'm excited about this. <laughs> Last week I came here and I really kvetched about, complained about the ADL and critical race theory, which I know because I did see the, I saw the whole program. And it, yeah, it's pretty much equity, which is this side wins and that side blues because they're bad. Um, and then you sign a pledge. I mean, it was kind of, you know, kind of, it had a lot of fancy words, but that's what it broke down to. So, but then I got a uh, email that said that the board is considering something called Mind Up. Am I right to say that? Mind Up? Have you heard of it? Or no? Oh, you don't know. All right, so what do I know? That's what I heard. So I looked it up. And Mind Up is, the in, um, is by the inspiration of Goldie Hawn. And Goldie Hawn became involved with this at 9-11, especially when she said, why is this happening? Our children are being raised to see this and that we can't have this. And then she got more into it. And she goes, why are the children sh shooting each other? Why are they so angry? Why are there gangs? Why are they cutting themselves? What's going on? And uh, she came up with the idea and she collaborated with a psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, uh, counselors, et cetera. And they came up with Mind Up. Mind Up is joy. Mind Up is finding joy in life, appreciation of your whole self. It's um, everybody's capable. Everybody has gifts. It doesn't separate. It binds. It brings people together. And it, and it is joyful because I got on the YouTube and I, and I watched it. And I thought, if anything was really going to help us, this would do it. And uh, breathing, calming down, how does the brain work? When you get angry, what happens? Oh, I should have. What happens here in the amygdala? What happens in the lower brain? What happens up here in your prefrontal cortex? And the kids were saying it. I've done similar, but I've never seen anybody else ever do this. So there was some, give me that, I want it. Oh, oh, oh. Is that this brain or is that this brain? Is it lower or up? Okay, it's lower. Could I have that, please? And it's a great way to teach. And then you teach parents this as well. Uh, the efficacy on this over the years has been the bullying is almost non-existent. And it's now it's in Colorado and a lot of different places. Hong Kong, I guess they're going to spread out. Um, the bullying is out. People want to come to school. Kids do want, they don't want to skip school. They want to be there. If you were to talk about what was the school climate and adult caring, I just think mind up is the answer. So thank you very much. I appreciate thank you. <laughs> Next we have um, Haley Jenkins, then Alicia B, and then Henny Abraham. Hello, Superintendent Smith, uh, President Bartow, and members of the board. First of all, I'd like to quickly say thank you for removing the ADL contract last week uh, from the agenda and keeping it off this week. I do hope um, that reminding you last week of your word to no longer use their organization will remain. 
Um, in an attempt to build trust with our community, it's very important when you all say something that you mean it. One of our main goals as a parent group is to work with you in creating transparency with all books, videos, curriculum, and any other materials that the students use. So this brings me to why I'm here right now, honesty and transparency. Last week, I presented you a form to agendize a creation of a library book review committee. Superintendent Smith, I hope you listen to me right now and you take notes because there's a very large community of people right now watching this. They are beyond upset that this is not being properly handled. So I hope you will give a clear, honest explanation to everyone in your upcoming comments. Last week, you mentioned there was already a group working to review library books. Who are they? Did you pick them? You mentioned there would be experts. Do we have to pay these experts? What is a library book expert? Let me just say, it does not take an expert to open a book and see pornographic pictures or read words depicting sex and violence targeted at young children. How did these titles end up in the school libraries? You said last week it was one book, but we all know it's not just one book. I can name at least 17 titles. Some of these titles were found in libraries all over the district. At Wilson, they had at least nine copies of one of the books. So now the library at Wilson is closed and the librarian is gone, but what about all the other librarians? Are you gonna let them all go? Who brought these books in? Multiple records requests have been submitted and none of them have come back to us. So that tells me that neither you nor the board nor the Wilson principal have any idea or you don't wanna be honest and transparent with the community. And seeing as how you had this in a closed session and we didn't hear about it, again, you're not being transparent. There was a meeting yesterday at Wilson that was poorly executed. The families were given an email at very short notice, the staff an even shorter notice, and the parents left with just as many questions as they came with. Nothing was announced online for the community to participate. So this is a very big problem. You are undermining the trust of many parents all across Costa Mesa and Newport. Everyone would like answers and frankly, a public apology for the children having to be exposed to this. So we hope you will make the proper decision to create this district-wide committee with parents, teachers, and community members and give us all an explanation of how these books come into our schools and work to restore the trust with the community. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Alicia B. And next, Henny Abraham, and next, Grace. Good evening. As a community member speaking on, on behalf of the Newport Mesa Uncensored community, I have been disheartened to observe the communication conveyed by the board and Superintendent Smith as related to the library books and petitioned review committee and would like to clarify for the public an unduly dwelling on falsehood and inaccuracy. On May, May 17th, two concerned individuals addressed the podium at the regular meeting to comment on inappropriate books at Wilson Elementary School. At the most recent regular meeting on June 14th, hour 1, minute 30, Superintendent Smith stated one library had the book in question and 21 did not. President Bartow also purported via publication the book that was found at Wilson Elementary. To be clear, there were 21 books of concern, five of which were intended for older age groups. Several descriptions of the book state pervasive profanity, explicit sexual situations, sexual references, violence, slurs, let's call this what it is, obscenity that would otherwise be of legal consequence. There's criminal offense in other settings, yet such materials can, can be checked out of a school library. The district falsely represents the materials are high quality and age appropriate. However, the secondary schools like Estancia, for instance, are overwhelmed with countless books with warnings such as, this book may contain coarse language and mature themes and may not be appropriate for young readers. Please discuss with your teacher or parent before reading. Furthermore, the results of the investigations have not been shared at the board meetings as <clears throat> you stated. The public should know that the employee from Wilson is no longer employed by the district. Are the other people, like Ms. Jenkins said, are they going to be held responsible for this obscenity? To complicate matters, the District of Beads public records requests regarding the library. Under the California Public Records Act, you have 10 days to respond and you are out of compliance to numerous of my requests, numerous requests submitted by myself. 
So altogether, your dishonesty and refusal to agendize the creation of a committee with diverse representative community participation to review these books at all sites shows the very communication from the district is antithetical to natural law. It shows the selfish interest per and perceived power within your elected and appointed seats. So I'll impart with this. We hold the contract power at the consent of the govern. The sol solution is clear. Through unrestrained strength, we will work to restore our power. After all, we are the true experts within our children's education. Thank you. Next we have Penny Abraham and then Grace. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for the follow-up um, last week. I was extremely hopeful that I was gonna stand in front of you and the only thing that I was gonna relay was my total gratitude for following up with my personal request with meeting with the parents at Wilson. I am extremely disappointed that I got phone call after phone call over the weekend because on Friday night at 5.30 p.m., there was an email sent to the parents of Wilson who I believe, I went back and I watched the re-recording of the meeting last week. I specifically said these parents do not get off work until about 7, 7.30 at night. On Friday evening at 5.30, they were informed that there will be a meeting on Monday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, so they had three days to prep at five o'clock between the hours of five to 5.30. Just gonna pause for a second. If somebody right now sent you guys an email at this hour and said to be available at five o'clock in three days, most of us are parents, first of all, most of us have jobs, we will panic. Because in our perfect world, even every, if every single parent at Wilson did not have two to three jobs to support their families and they had a regular eight to five job, it would still take them about 15 minutes to get somewhere. They would not be able to be anywhere at five o'clock. I do apologize, I know I am getting a bit emotional, but it is very frustrating that they opened that email thinking that, hey, we are being hurt. And yet again, there was another obstacle. Now they feel left out. Thank God for the seven of them that showed up and some of the community organizers that showed up. I have been meeting with them a couple of times since I've heard about this, if you put a meeting on after seven o'clock, they come. And with all this amazing hiring that we have, I'm sure we can find a little bit of money to pay our staff overtime for one night to be there for them between the off hours. I understand it's inconvenient, but they should not keep feeling like they're not being heard. So I express my utmost gratitude for the try but please try better. It is to serve their community, maybe put a survey out and see what time is convenient for them to be able to come and then schedule a meeting. And please give them at least a little bit more than a weekend to decide if they can join the meeting or not. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next we have Grace. Good evening, everyone. Um, last week I was here and read a summary from a book that we have in our school libraries, Wilson, Ensign, T. Winkle, and several high schools. It's called They Both Die at the End. It's a dystopian story about two boys that fall in love with each other, teenage boys, and die after they're told they would in a setting that's based uh, in a city like, San, like uh, New York City. Um, this book and many others are in our district school libraries and is not meant to be read by young children. Um, it's inappropriate, it's for older children, and it's in many of our school libraries. And I'd like to call attention to the fact that in Dr. Smith's comments, his response was, it's one book and it's at one school and it's being addressed. Um, Wilson surely doesn't feel like it's one book and it's at one school and they don't feel like it's being addressed at all. Um, it's not one book, it's several books, it's 21 books. I personally looked through the digital library that I'm now locked out of, which is absurd. Um, it's several schools, 
uh, many of us stand at this podium every month and we talk about transparency. We speak a lot about transparency and we don't feel like we're being heard. We don't feel like you guys are listening. That's obviously an issue for us and the people watching us on YouTube at home every time we're here. Um, and so we just wanna say, we don't feel like we're being heard when we're telling you guys, we want transparency, we wanna understand what's going on, we wanna understand what our materials are, what our kids are looking at. Um, so we just want that to be very clear. We wanna feel like we're being heard and we also want to feel like when we're getting comments back from our superintendent that it's being honest and last week, Shirley did not feel that way. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Allison. Good evening. Switching gears a little bit. So, okay, so there's a song by Journey, you know, Don't Stop Believing. We all know the song. There's a, song, there's a part in there about born and raised in South Detroit. That's me. Um, my husband and I moved here, relocated in 2010 for our careers. Our son was born in 2014. 2018, because I'm not from here, I'm from South Detroit, I'm like, ah, what are my school options, right? So I start Googling stuff. And a very informative video that I would encourage everyone in this room to go back and watch is by Dr. Duke Pesta. It's called Common Core Six Years Later. You know, the Common Core math standards, or I should say education standards, that hijacked our education, public education system back in 2010, personally funded $6 billion by Bill Gates. He goes through the whole history of public education from inception to, to how we got to where we're at now. It was after that presentation, we made a decision. There's no way our child's going to a public school anywhere in the country. It, it, it just wasn't gonna happen. So, you know, I'm standing here as someone who lives in the district, whose property values and taxes fund the schools in the district. And, you know, I'm also advocating for the kids whose parents either are unaware of what's happened to public education since they grew up in public education and advocating for those, you know, children who parents aren't able to afford private education. So, you know, I feel very strongly about this. These are the kids in my community. These are the kids on my son's sports teams. My son is now going into second grade, not masked, very well socially, you know, acclimated. Math, reading, science, off the charts, only writes in cursive, speaks the second language that we don't speak at home, right? Seven years old. And ironically, his tuition is at a 40% discount to the price per head of the students in this district. So, you know, the public school model has moved from a model of excellence to equity. Equity is a race to the middle. It's equity strives for mediocrity. And this all is covered in this video by Dr. Duke Pesta. See, when you focus on excellence, then you're trying to give every child the opportunity at the best education possible. But when you're focused on equity, it's about, you know, equalizing the outcome. So no one group statistically has, you know, numbers above or below any other group because, hey, you know, it's not fair that some kids you know, aren't good at math. So let's just make sure we bring the bar down to the middle to the common core and make sure no kids are really that good at math. I mean, it, it completely diverges from STEM-based education. So, you know, it acts as a ceiling, not a floor. Equity stunts growth. Equity policies are implemented and it hurts kids of all ethnic groups. Jason Zimba, the architect of Common Core Math, covers this very well. I'm running out of time. So all I have to say is, you know, the, the teachers don't work for the school board. They work to educate the next generation of patriots to compete on a global level. Let's do better. Return to excellence. Thank you. We move to item uh, that concludes our community and put on non-agendized items. Um, superintendent's comments is next. All right, the um, board president made a statement at the beginning of the meeting about the library books, and so I'm not gonna mansplain what she said. That, that will stay on the record. Um, as far as ADL goes, um, it's not on the agenda. Uh, we're really excited that uh, doctors Bolton and Haley are looking at some programs right now to bring a recommendation forward to the board. So we're excited to see uh, what they're looking into. Certainly um, are hopeful uh, that these are uh, programs 
that have demonstrated to benefit student leaders, which is what we're looking to do. Um, and can't wait for them to come and present to all of you. Uh, I, would, I would say this, and I, I wasn't going to uh, bring it up again, but since it continues to come up, I'll, I'll just say that um, it's interesting that we misrepresent words even when they're in print. Um, it's really clear in the email passed around what I've said about ADL. Moreover, I had a phone conversation with someone in the audience last Monday and clarified. When we had this conversation, you'll remember we were talking about implicit bias. It's in the email, right? It's specific. I said we weren't talking about the student program. The student program has parental choice, something your group fights for, parental choice. Very different from the implicit bias. That was for employees. Parents couldn't choose. They couldn't see the content. This is parental choice, 100% opt-in. This is different. He didn't say, no, that's not what you said. He didn't say you misrepresented it. He said, but you gotta be able to find someone better. Like get someone from Tesla to teach leadership. Okay, we can have that conversation about there is a better program. But to, can you just say when it's in print that someone lied about that? Yeah, that's unfortunate. As far as the documentation uh, and comments about the books, if we go back and look, I think one person represented it here. In relation to the book in question, we found it in one library. We haven't made comments on the investigation because it's ongoing. So we'll share that in appropriate time. Um, but but just, just so that we're, we're taking these things um, and we're looking at them with, with facts, I, I think that's uh, in, important. The, the Common Core, um, we're not looking at the mass standards now. I, um, I appreciate the comments mined up. Uh, it's a great program. We're excited to bring it in and we hope that it is as successful as, as you um, think it will be. But again, as it relates to uh, the library book issue, that's already been commented on by Trustee Bartow. We move to 16 community input on agendized items. Do we have any comments on agenda items? Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if that speaker pre prefers to do so. Uh, we have three comments on 18D, 19C. Um, let's see, do you, if you wish to come and do, have your comment now on 18D or 19C, you may do so, otherwise I'm happy to call that again right before that item. Okay, okay, go ahead, come on. Okay, so I'll call um, first Haley Jenkins on item 18D, and then, um, Wendy Lease on 19C, and Alicia B on 19C. Okay, hello again. Um, I hate to keep coming up here like this because I really do wanna stand up here one day and be so excited for all the great changes in the district, um, but lately it seems like one little fire goes out and then three more are started in its place. Last week we all sat through the budget proposal and we heard Mr. Trader say enrollment is trending downward. We hope to get those students back and that's what we're going to work towards. One staff member laughably mentioned that it was due to all the people moving out of the state. And I'm sure some people are moving. Um, and I don't know about you, but honestly, I can't name a family that I know that has fled Costa Mesa or Newport. But I can name at least 12 families that have pulled their kids from the district to homeschool, moved to private school, or moved to just another district. This year, we're budgeting $100,000 for restorative practices. That's kind of like defund the police. Let's stop punishing kids for bad behavior and we'll see what happens. A third of our property taxes will go to employee pensions, one third. And tonight we will, I assume, pass a cool $15,000 for more social emotional learning. So how are our kids doing ab academically, by the way? I got an email the other day celebrating two new assistant superintendents, Mr. Trader being one of them, but I'm not here about you, sir. Um, let's talk about Socorro Shields. 
$260,000 for an assistant superintendent of achievement, innovation, and continuous improvement. What is that? Instead of you all doing your jobs, you outsourced yet another person and created a sham position. Let's be honest, she's a diversity, equity, and inclusion hire that's here to tell you all how racist our district is and its policies are. Did you do any research on her at all before she was hired? I did. I've watched many videos, read a whole bunch of articles about her, written, read a lot of stuff she's written. You know she was unanimously voted to be let go from her last job as superintendent of Sonoma Valley Unified and the district she was in before that in Santa Rosa, she had an investigation into her launch after parents and staff were very angry about her funding issues. She penned open letters and has spoken out widely about fighting systemic racism, being anti-racist like Ibram X. Kendi, and how she intends to dismantle, there's equity, gobbledygook after gobbledygook. This is a way to bring positive change to our schools, right? By hiring her and bring enrollment back up? When Mr. Trader said last week, the money we have for this next year is a lot and it's not normal. It's not. He said we need to be very careful about thinking how we move forward. He said we're very concerned about funding for transportation. And last week, Ashley, you said a teacher mentioned only getting $250 for materials and you had a really great idea to give them much more this year. So listen to what you are saying and then look at what you are doing. These poor Thank choices you. will get you nowhere. Wendy Lease, now you can see. Good evening again. The budget, and I always like Mr. Trader's um, presentation. And um, I would suggest that, in to be more transparent, that maybe at the mid year, you have a study session to invite the, the community to not wait until the meeting where you're going to have the public hearing on the, the first public hearing. The city of Costa Mesa has a study session. They actually had two study sessions, one for operations and another one for construction and, and um, you know, buildings and everything. I think you need to be transparent. You also need a finance committee. We used to have a finance committee after the bankruptcy and whatever happened to that? Because that's community oversight. And I think you're seeing across the nation that the taxpayers, grandparents, parents, singles, we are all focused on public education because we want it to be the best and represent our community. So have a study session on the budget mid-year uh, if I need to, I'll fill out a form to agendize a, a FIPAC, a Finance and Pension Advisory Committee. I serve on the one for the city of Costa Mesa. I also think it is high time that you have a, a school facilitator at each school that's needed. Why has it taken so long? Why is the West Side, why are the West Side schools always not at, at just emphasized in their needs. Why, why, why is that, that it's taken at Ms. Anderson so long to finally get more facilitators for those schools? It's taken too long. I do represent Newport Mesa Uncensored, and we, we are diggers. We are researchers. We are not good. We're going to be back here because we love our public schools and we love our community. Uh, so we want to see these things in the budget. I do want to thank you though, and I thank Ms. Anderson. Finally, it took three years to break free from the rules of the TIC fund, the Irvine Company fund, that finally changed a little word or two to release $400,000 for enhancement or enrichment. I can't remember which word, but that's ridiculous that it took so long. Think of all the kids that could have been helped and the, and the things that could be done for kids. Things should not take that long. So I, I, I think there's a lot of things in here. I don't approve of hiring uh, Ms. Shield because I think that's excessive. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Alicia B. Okay, 
everybody. Hello again. Um, so I appreciate your time. I genuinely do. I know I've met with several of you in person and have been able to articulate my perspective. And I come from a background of education. I'm a school psychologist, a licensed educational psychologist, a board certified behavior analyst. I've worked um, in various districts throughout the county. And so I come as an advocate for our children. And so my uh, frustrations are on behalf of a community and students that I genuinely care for and need to fight for in order to improve the current system, which is devastating. So on um, this specific item, I just want to say that the knowledge and understanding and intellectual disposition see seems to to not exist um, due to reliance on trust without due diligence that has negatively impacted fiscal management and most importantly, the needs of our students and staff. So Ms. Haley and I don't get together to write our comments, but it seems like we echo the same um, sentiment and points. So were you aware that Ms. Shields was terminated in her previous employment with a school district, and she left Santa Rosa, Rosa City Schools strained. Um, I don't see the need for the creation of a position that costs and is utilizing a quarter of a million of our taxpayer dollars. Um, what's somewhat humorous is the um, email that went out to describe her position. So she will develop, coordinate, and direct a plan that not only supports the district's vision while promoting inclusion for all, but also responds to the diversity of student staff in the community. Um, and she will craft a comprehensive strategy, yada, yada, yada. Pretty much what you have a $355,000 superintendent five currently existing assistant superintendent. Now you add another two to the list. So this is a lot of money. Um, and in the budget report, Mr. Trader indicates so, and we had a presentation on UTK funding and the fact that over, I'm gonna quote him, over the long run, this will directly lead to a reduction of student support services for our students. So we know that there is an financial implication, impact for our, our student support, yet you continue to create these upper management positions that are seemingly incompetent and wasteful. Thank you. Next, we move to item 17, consent calendar. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. May I have a second? Second. <clears throat> it's been moved by Trustee Matore and seconded by Trustee Yelsey. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ersoilu? Yes. Trustee Wygand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Thank you. All right, now we move to item 18A. Approve our 2022-2023 student board members. So we said farewell to our board members at our previous meeting, and we're really excited to uh, welcome our 2022-2023 student board members. So we welcome um, Back Bay Monta Vista High School student Daniela Ramirez and Brenton Tate as her alternate, Cloud Campus Ethan Kraus. And if you guys want to come up as I call your name, that would be great. Um, and if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, <laughs> Corona Del Mar High School, we have Theo T.J. Brokos, and we are still waiting on an application from Costa Mesa High School, so put the word out if you know students there. Um, early College High School, we've got Marcelina Sanchez, and Estancia High School, <laughs> Fernando Barañón, and Newport Harbor High School, Kate Cherry. And I don't know if our public information officer is here, but Vanessa, would you mind taking a photo? You guys can turn around, we'll get a picture up here. Okay. 
respond quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we're really excited to have them all here. Uh, we interviewed them, and they are just uh, really delightful and smart students who are excited to be advocates for their high schools, and we're excited to have them. So uh, may I have a motion to approve the slate? As so read. moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Matoy, seconded by Trustee Anderson. Roll call vote. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Matoya? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ersoilu? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Since you were just voted in, you don't have to go to the next July meeting. You don't have to go to that. Um, your responsibilities start in August, and we're hoping to make sure that we can schedule. Typically, we do a dinner meeting before the regular board meeting where you can bring your parents, and they can come, and we can meet everybody. And we'll give you a hint of what your job duties are, but we've done that. You're showing up is 90% of your job, so that's huge. And... We're excited to say, we're very excited that you carved out some time from your summer to come in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And you may stay as long as you need to. You don't have to keep stay the whole time. <laughs> um, all right, we, with that we move to item 18B, approve 2022-2023 declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Dr. Torres. So I'm stepping in for Leona Olson this evening, who's uh, not present. So um, in front of you, you have the Declaration of Need for Fully Qualified Educators. And what that is is a document just letting the state know where we have challenging areas that are hard to fill or where we have had um, unique circumstances this year. And we are required by law to let the state know how many of these we predict that we're going to have. Um, and so we do have a shortage area um, in the areas of dual immersion for Spanish and Mandarin. So that's a projected need. Um, and then we also have um, some additional needs in special education, um, as well as some of our single subject areas, which are also hard to find, which is um, science, world languages, and other social sciences. Thank you. Do I have any So questions? moved. Oh. I, oh, yeah. I have a question. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have a plan specifically for the dual immersion teachers to maybe publicize in a new or different mm -hmm. way or go to any job fairs this summer? Yes, we do. In fact, we are involved in several job fairs, Alliant, Biola, Cal State Fullerton, Long Beach, <laughs> UMass, Global, National, Irvine, Laverne, and Redland. So those are our Great. current. Um, and one of the things I would say about dual immersion is while the program has been longstanding, um, it's a longstanding academic program, it is a very challenging area. Mm -hmm. uh, Cal State Fullerton and Irvine are the two leaders in, in our local neighborhood that produce the highest quality of dual immersion teachers. Um, and so we've done a lot to work directly with them. And we have had student teachers in the past being part of our program, um, which helps us in turn feed ourselves <laughs> selfishly, which is wonderful. Um, and so Leona um, Olson has been continuing to do that work. And, and yes, we are participating at all levels. Um, and we are trying to continue to attract and retain high quality talent as we continue to evaluate our needs for the DI programs. Thank you. Well, I'm, I move to approve the 2022-2023 Declaration of Need for Fully Qualified Educators. May I have a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved by Trustee Crane and seconded by Trustee Wigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Berto? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay. Great. With that, we move to item 18C, adopt the local control and accountability plan. Dr. Torres? Yes, and again in front of you tonight is the actual local control and accountability plan, the tongue twister, the ALCAP. Um, you've heard several presentations prior to this evening regarding um, the local indicators and the plan itself. And so tonight you have in front of you to approve the plan. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve? I move uh, to approve the local control and accountability plan. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Trustee Wigand and seconded by Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoya? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. I did have one question that occurred to me. I, I mean, we already voted right, so it's okay. 
Um, I had one thing that occurred to me that that I didn't see in the LCAP, um, and I I know we talked about it a lot before the pandemic, but I, maybe you got you know distracted and delayed. Um, I'm wondering. I was wondering how we are with implementing the English language roadmap for the continuum for our students. Is that well, and because we've already in voted and done the whole thing, maybe we could ask for that for, for next time. Well, no, I don't want to, I just want to know if it's part of it and I missed it. Okay. Um, in terms of the English language um, roadmap, in terms of what we're doing with the that particular plan, we are continuing to work on our English language learner development program. Um, Laura Dalpash, who is not present tonight, would be able to come back and provide additional details regarding our, our internal plan for English learners and the work that we've continued to do. Um, I will say that in your LCAP, you will see that there are elements of English learner programs and supports and um, actions that support that group of students and that instructional program. Um, but we can come back at a later date if you still have questions specifically regarding that. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, we move to item 18D, approve SELPA local plan services plan and SELPA annual budget plan for the 2022-2023 school year, Dr. Jockham. Great, thank you, President Bartow. Um, before you tonight, you have uh, approval for the SELPA annual budget and services plan, which is a required component under Ed Code, where we as a district uh, determine or describe to the state what our programs and services for special education are at each of our school sites, including our non-public schools, our preschool programs, and our residential treatment programs. And we include a snapshot of the budget that we have to ensure that we can pay for these services for students. So we ask for your approval tonight. Thank you. Do I have any questions? I move that we approve the SELPA local plan services plan and the SELPA annual budget plan for the 2022 school year. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Trustee Matoye, seconded by Trustee Wigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Elsie? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> dropped off the big letters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, we move to item 19, uh, resolution adoption calendar, and 19A is adopt resolution 30-06-22, Newport Mesa Unified School District, authorization of signatures for the Orange County Department of Education. Mr. Trader. So, this is a routine uh, update for signature authority with the Orange County Department of Ed to um, make some updates for new staff. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Crane and seconded by Trustee Matoye. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Thank you. We move to 19B, adopt resolution 31-06-22. Establish, establishing MUFG Union Bank, NA, as depository for various district accounts and authorizations therewith. Mr. Trader. Beginning July 1, the district will be so with uh, SoCal Relief for its property liability insurance, and this account will allow us to uh, settle claims. I have a motion to approve. So moved. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead, Trustee Anderson. So moved. It's been moved by Trustee Anderson. May I have a second? Second. Seconded by trust. It's been moved by Trustee Anderson and seconded by Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoya? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay. Um, we move to 19C, adopt resolution 32-06-22, all funds, final budget. Yeah, before you, the adoption for the all funds uh, June budget in um, <clears throat> for the 22-23 year uh, with two corrections, uh, one uh, for the organizational charts and one for assumption number 23 related to arts and athletic funding, $7,000 for the middle schools. Yay. And I misspoke, so I'm going to call for the motion with the correct language. Um, I call for a motion for adopt resolution 32-06-22, all funds, June, June budget. budget. 
So moved. Second. Okay, it's been Under moved by Trustee Matoy. Seconded. Oh, uh, that's fine. Trust seconded by Trustee Wigand. Crane. Trustee Crane, you had a question? No, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I wanted to thank you for answering all of our robust questions that we had ahead of time. So thank you for taking the time. I know it was kind of a back-to-back -back meeting, and um, you really were very timely in your answers because uh, we all do look at this budget very, um, very um, judiciously. judiciously um, and so we appreciate your answers ahead of time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so now we may have a roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoya? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Arsoilu? Yes. Trustee Wygant? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay. All right, with that we move to informal reports. Very few tonight, which will make all of you excited. I uh, want to let you know that we are continuing our work. We mentioned uh, several meetings ago that we're bringing together uh, a school safety task force to look at that, led by some of our folks, industry experts, uh, community members and parents. And we're having community forums uh, in our area. So there'll be flyers sent out, uh, identifying when we have them in Newport Harbor, Estancia, Costa Mesa and Corona del Mar areas. So those will be available for folks. We welcome their feedback and we'll continue that work uh, this summer. So we get back to the school year uh, in the best position we possibly can and then continue from there on out. Uh, to make these improvements that our students and faculty deserve. But that concludes my reports. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add a big thank you to that. I met and uh, invited Dr. Smith along a couple times, but I've met with many community members who have uh, concerns and wanted to speak about safety, and so it's nice that we're going to have this opportunity for a larger group uh, other than those who just have reached out to me personally. So thank you for that. And I, that concludes my report since we were just here last week. And I, um, Trustee Ursoilu, Dr. Trustee Ursoilu and I met with the um, Youth Sports Committee and it was again a wonderful committee. They thanked everybody in our district for all the cooperation for the Daily Pilot Cup because it ran so well and ran so smoothly in spite of the fact that Jack Hammett isn't quite finished yet, but they're optimistic that it will be done. They're hopeful by the 1st of July, but it's construction, so you, we can't hold them to anything. Um, and there will be no meeting next month. Of that, of that committee meeting. <laughs> there will be no meeting of the Costa Mesa United Youth yeah, Sports see, Committee meeting. Was, uh -huh. I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> no, we have to come. No, we have, we still have our meeting, but they're, they, they take July off because we run everything really well. And their big concern was water, and we said, we water when we can, and if they stop us, we won't. Thank you. Um, I want to thank um, Ms. Hernandez for being here tonight and, and serving on DLAG for all these years. Um, I, you're, I, I love your candor, and I, I like the fact that not only do you uh, provide the positives, but you also give us some good constructive criticism, and we enjoy that. It's good to be candid and open, so thank you for your service. I'm sure Ms. Anderson will probably say more to that, but I just wanted to recognize you myself. And also wanted to thank uh, Superintendent um, Smith on expanding and clarifying um, the statements um, regarding to the email on November 1st, the November 1st email, because when we hear that our superintendent has said something and it's not not the truth, then we need to hear why and not, and also explore the statement and understand the context. So thank you for doing that. And uh, we had our special ed community advisory committee meeting uh, was it on the 17th? And this is the, it's a, it's a committee that uh, includes parents, staff, uh, which is uh, Juliana Salvao, and then um, Ms. Metoye and I are also liaisons. And we basically looked at the bylaws of the committee, which was very interesting. And, and uh, we just wanted to clarify the fact that we're liaisons. We don't serve on the committee, but we are liaisons of the board to the committee. And so it's always nice and refreshing to hear a parent, parent perspective um, when it comes to special ed and the support services that are provided. So thank you. Um, I don't have anything that I went to since school is over, um, but I would just love to um, have a discussion at some point um, in the budget 
Um, we now have the money that is available for F Fund 17, and so we have to decide as a board mm -hmm. how to use that. Yeah. If that's for Lexia for some schools or after school programs for some schools that don't have the funding, I would love the opportunity for us to talk about that. Lunch art. Or lunch, lunch art, art. Yeah. yes, yeah. by Mrs. Haley. That would be great. Um, but just to have the, the discussion about that soon before school starts so we can use it for the first time. Um, and I am also really thankful um, for the local indicators for the um, introduction of a preschool to third grade early literacy initiative. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for bringing that into our district and for focusing on that. I think it's been a long time coming and it's near and dear to my heart and I'm thankful that we're finally doing that. And thank you, yes, Carla, for being the DWEC president for three years. You've been there every single time that I've seen you. Every, t every time, every meeting I've ever been to, you've been there, so thank you. And I'll just echo what everyone has said. Thank you, Carla. Um, thank you to DLAC for being such a great group of parents. And I just want to highlight that she mentioned um, a group that's near and dear to my heart, Latino Health Access, and how great she found their programming to be. And I'd just like to elevate that they also have parent advocacy trainings that they can do as well. And it would be great for Newport Mesa to explore that further. Um, after parents maybe go to the Crecer program, maybe looking into Latino Health Access's program for uh, training parents how to speak up and advocate for their children would be a really great addition to the district. Um, and that's that's all I have in one more thing. Nope, not all I have. I <laughs> lied. Um, <laughs> um, I want to thank the T. Winkle parents, future parents of T. Winkle that have been reaching out to me um, nonstop about um, how we can continue to improve T. Winkle together. So there are a lot of elementary parents out there that have been researching and emailing and following up on all the transformations that are happening at T. Winkle and just making sure that we keep moving the ball forward on that one. So thank you. I just wanted to uh, say thank you to Lance for all of the work that we've seen at our um, schools. The first week after school's out, I see trucks there at every pretty, pretty much every campus fixing up something and getting it ready for the next school year. And also just a big shout out for getting chlorine. If, <laughs> if you know, you know, keeping our pools open. So thank you. I knew you Good job. Thank you. With that, I will adjourn the meeting at 8 p.m. exactly. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>